Welcome to this video where I want to have a look at some common Vue.js questions I see a lot. This is by no means complete, just some questions that came into my head. Please share any other questions you have in the video comments. I probably won't answer them there, but I might create a second and third and other parts of this series in the future. So let's dive right into it. Let's start with the first question I see a lot. Do I need, do you need a complex build setup or workflow? Do you need a setup with Webpack and Babel and all these things? The answer is, it depends on what you're building. You can absolutely drop in or drop Vue into HTML pages where you want to use it. Just import Vue.js and you can start using it. You can use the Vue CLI to create a project with it. This gives you a feature-rich workflow with zero setup that you can still customize 100% since you get access to the underlying Webpack configuration. So this is, in my opinion, the best approach, especially if you're building single page applications. There you have one workflow that simply works and that's continuously updated by the people developing it. You can also build your own workflow with Webpack and Babel and so on. This of course is a good solution if you need a highly customized setup right from the start, but in most cases the Vue CLI is best. One exception are multi-page applications, which you also can build with Vue.js, you're not limited to single page applications. There you often work with the drop-in import because it's convenient. You just add it to the pages where you want to use some Vue feature and then you just create some Vue instances and start controlling parts of the screen. So that's the general theme. Drop in, straight for multi-page applications on smaller projects. Medium-sized and bigger projects use the CLI. If you got highly specific requirements, use the custom setup from the start. But again, you can customize a CLI project too. So this might always be the best approach. One other question I see a lot is, should I use ES6 or other next gen features or ES5? Because you can write view apps with both syntaxes. You can use function or arrow functions. You can use whichever features you want in a workflow that supports it. Like for example, workflows created with the view CLI. And there is no right or wrong here. Really use the syntax you want. Often next generation JavaScript makes many things easier makes it easier to solve certain problems. So that would be my recommendation. Go with next generation, so ES6 plus JavaScript, but in the end, you are free to use whichever you feel more comfortable with. Important, when using Vue.js as a drop-in import, so outside of a bigger build workflow, you're limited by the capabilities of the browsers you're building for. Most browsers, don't support all next gen features yet, so you're maybe forced to use ES5 then. Here's another interesting question. View instances versus view components. We have both in view apps. We get our instances and components. What's the difference? Now, an instance allows us to control some DOM in an HTML file with that L property. Now, theoretically, that's not the only thing an instance can do. You can use an instance without connecting it to the DOM, but typically you will use that L property to say, hey, in this DOM, I want to control this part with my instance, and now I can use features like that templating syntax with the double curly braces to output my text property, which I also manage in the instance. And if you're starting off with a view, you're always or often just working with one instance where you have methods and some data and computed properties maybe, and check out my view series or course if you want to learn more about this, where you have all these things and where you control parts of the DOM with that instance. This is especially useful for multi-page applications where you maybe want to control some parts of the DOM which was rendered by the server with a couple of different view instances. Now components work well together with instances. We also have our DOM and HTML file, but now we maybe have a hook. So some DOM code, some HTML code, which should act as a hook for a view instance, which then in turn uses a couple of components in its own template. 
So we could replace that div with a template defined in the instance and start using these components in that template. Maybe it becomes a bit clearer with this graphic. We got our DOM here on the right with a couple of divs. This is the HTML code we wrote. And we control parts of that DOM, but not everything with a couple of different view instances. And in the template of each instance, so for example, between the div tags where we have ID products, we could start using our components. These components are created with the view component method and they have a template and work a lot like instances, but are reusable. Instances are not reusable. Instances are always connected to just one place in the DOM. And if you have something like a card, you know these cards, material design cards, you know from apps, they look beautiful. If you have something like that, which you want to reuse probably, let's say in a V4 loop, that doesn't work with instances. It does work with components though. So components allow you to create reusable building blocks for your view apps. What about other third-party JavaScript libraries you wanna use in your view app? You can do that. You have a couple of options. You can add script imports either to a CDN or to a local file in the index.html file. And this also refers to multi-page applications where you add it to that file where you need the, well, package. Or you use a local import. So you have downloaded a file and now you import it directly into your JavaScript file with an import statement in that file. If you are building view apps, you use import statements in your JavaScript files all the time. And this now applies mostly to single page apps because for drop-in imports in multi-page apps, import statements aren't understood by most browsers. But if you have a build workflow that bundles everything together in the end, this will work. And this is how you then import other JavaScript packages, which will just be included in that big bundle in the end by adding such an import. Of course, you can also use npm or yarn, so dependency managers, to install and download these packages and then still import them via import statement. And for CSS, it's pretty similar. There, we can also use links in index.html or in HTML files in general, pointing to CSS libraries lying on some CDN or locally on our web server. Or we use a local file that we import with the import statement into our JavaScript file. Now that sounds strange. Importing CSS into a JavaScript file? Well, this has one important prerequisite. You need to be using a workflow that supports it. For example, one created with the view CLI. There, if you use the Webpack setup, it supports the import of CSS files. It doesn't actually import them and mix them with JavaScript. Instead, it makes Webpack aware of the existence of that file. And if your workflow then has the appropriate modules to handle that file type, which the default CLI created Webpack setup has, then this will also include the CSS file in your final app, automatically make sure it's injected into your index.html file and everything like that. So this is all managed for you by just adding an import to a CSS file into your JavaScript file. And only in one file is enough, this will already include it. And of course here you can also use package managers to download that CSS library like Bootstrap for example and then add that import. Everyone can see your code. Now this is something I also hear a lot and it's true. If you open the browser developer tools and you have a look at the source tab there, you can access the JavaScript files that are powering the page you're currently on. And there's nothing you can do. JavaScript runs in the browser, you can't hide it, it's not pre-compiled, so it's not kind of unreadable. Everyone can read it, you can't avoid that. You have to ensure that you don't put security relevant or sensible information into that file. And that's about the only thing you can do, unfortunately. You just have to be aware of this. There's no way to hide it. It's visible to everyone. Can I use Redux with Vue.js is a question I get a lot. Yes, you can. Redux is not a library which is closely tied to React, though it's often used in conjunction with it. And you can implement Redux into Vue. Though my recommendation would be to use the Vue-specific implementation, Vuex. 
it's by the same developers as Vue and therefore nicely integrates into Vue applications and works nicely together with Vue. So have a look at Vuex. I also got a series on that and I do cover it in my Vue course on Udemy 2. Links to both can be found in the video description, of course. And with that, you get a powerful tool for managing state on a, in a central place in your Vue application. Can you use Vue with PHP or Laravel, a framework, a PHP framework, or Node or any other server-side language or framework? The answer is yes. Vue runs in the client, in the browser. It doesn't care about your server-side framework or language. Still, we can differentiate between single-page applications and multi-page applications. And let me explain what the difference then is. In both cases, you can use any server-side backend, though, however. So for single-page applications, Vue controls the entire frontend, and we only get one file, the index.html file, from the server. For multi-page applications, we only control parts of the views which are rendered by the backend. Now for single page applications, our server sends that single index HTML file where the view app then runs and controls the entire front end. And all further communication where we might need to store data on the server or fetch data from there happens with a RESTful API, which, and that's important, could also run on a different server. View really doesn't care. Now for a multi-page application approach, we also got a server and there we render our views. So we send multiple pages for different requests. And if we click on a link there, for example, we send a new request to the server and get back a new view. And then view, the, the library, the framework, runs in some or in all of these views. That's totally up to you. So you then use view in there. You don't have a RESTful service because Vue is now communicating with your Vue. And if you need to directly communicate to your server, you would do this with an AJAX request, providing one RESTful endpoint, I guess. But in general, the, the approach is a different one because the server plays a more important role when it comes to rendering the views, the front end. It doesn't do that at all in a single page application approach. My state is lost after page reloads. That's also something I hear a lot. And it's true. If you're coming from a traditional web application, web page environment, you used sessions to manage the user state if the user is logged in or something like that. Now for single page applications, and that's important, it only applies for that, of course, if your server is closely connected to the front end because it's rendering views. So if you have a multi-page application, then you might still use sessions. But for single page applications, the front end, the single page, is kind of detached from the back end. So we don't use sessions there. We can't really do that. The back end is stateless instead. We got two other options for storing data in state. One is local storage, and one is, of course, a server side database. Local storage is a client side storage mechanism, like cookies a bit. It runs in the browser and it can be accessed through JavaScript. You can't directly access it from the server or anything like that. It's a simple key value store, so complex data can't be stored there. But it's great, for example, for storing a JSON web token, which is often used for authentication in single page applications. And when your view app starts, you can have a look at local storage and see if and which data already is in there and possibly initialize your view app with that data. Hence, keeping the old state. Now, not all the state should be stored here. I said that we don't use sessions, but of course, on your RESTful API, you probably have a database. This database is fully under your control since it runs on the server. It's accessible only from the server, which can be a security advantage. And you can use any database you want. You can store any types of data you want. You're not limited to a key value store here. A uh, server-side database is the right choice for any data that needs to be long time persisting. So let's say you plan on storing the, the orders of a user. You could do that in local storage, but whenever the user uninstalls the browser or cleans up the, the cache and the storage, this will be lost. For some state, this is okay. For other state, it is not. And that should then be stored in your server-side database.
Can you host your app on Heroku, etc.? So on hosts that run uh, server-side languages, for example, Node.js and so on. Well, let's have a look at what we get when we build our view application. And with that, I'm again talking about a single page application. Multi-page applications, you host these on a server which supports the server-side language you're using because it's your server-side that's rendering the views. Single page applications are detached from the backend though, so you can host them separately. If you build your view application for production, for example, in a Vue CLI project setup using Webpack, then you get a couple of files, an index.html file, a couple of JavaScript files, and maybe a couple of style files. All these files are static files. There's no server side code in there. The JavaScript file doesn't use Node.js, it will run in the browser eventually. So therefore, we don't need a host that is capable of executing server-side code. Any static host, like AWS S3 or Firebase hosting does. So search for static web host when you're looking for a host for your view single page application. Here's another common problem I see a lot. My routes don't work after deployment. So here are you, the user, the user using the web page and the server. You enter a URL and what you get back is a page where your view application runs. And I'm talking about a single page application again here. For multi-page applications, you're not going to run in this problem because all the routing is done on the server there. For your single page application, however, the routes are stored on the front end in your view app. So if you click somewhere in your view app and you access, let's say, slash products, then this works because the view app knows the routes because you defined them there. And by clicking on a link where you always then add some special routing directive or something like that, view catches that click and doesn't really send a request to the server but instead handles it internally, checks if it knows the route and re-renders the page accordingly. The server doesn't store any routes, doesn't have any routes. Now, if you click the refresh button of your browser, you'll face an issue. All of a sudden, Vue has no chance of handling that route because if you refresh the page, a new request is sent to the server and that request targets slash products. Now here, we then get a 404 error because the server doesn't know that route. The problem is we would know it in the view app. And to give the view the chance of taking over and looking for the route, we need to set up a rule, a configuration on the server to always return the index.html file, which hosts our view app, even for 404 cases. This means that instead of a 404 error, we now again get the index.html file with the view app where we can look for that specific route and if it finds it, it can render the according page. And if you still want to provide a 404 page for routes that aren't defined there either, you would need to add a catch all route in your view router setup. So a route that catches all unknown requests and then renders some default page from within your view application. So that was it. I hope this was helpful. If you watch the other Q&A videos, you might have seen some, well, connections. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, share any other questions you have in the video comments. I won't reply there. I can't offer any help there, but I will note them and I will see if I can create some future videos covering these questions. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you back here on Academind in the future. Bye.